Hi, good evening and welcome to Unsuited. Unsuited is powered by IDEX Legal and The Grey Matter. Our guests for today are a delightful mother-daughter duo. Well, their legal practice is fairly private in nature. They work closely with their clients to facilitate change in their personal lives. They're confidants and counselors before their some very excellent lawyering skills take over. Please welcome Rinalini Deshmukh and Devika Deshmukh Doshi today. Hi, Devika. Hi, Tanisha. Thank you for joining us. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Hi, good us. evening. How lovely to be with all of you. Likewise. Hi, Devika. Hi, Dunali, ma'am. Hi, hi. Nice to meet you guys. Yeah, thank you for gracing us on this uh, very, thank you for gracing us on this very non-technical legal webinar. You know, so it's very much about bringing out the personalities behind the you know, the, the lawyers. Um, we're going to deep dive with you, Dunali, first. Um, thank you, you, thank you for having us here. Thank you for having us here. Pleasure. So, uh, Dunali, ma'am, you grew up um, at the government, you know, GLC, Government Law College, before becoming a lawyer. Um, and then, so just tell us a bit about how was that experience with, you know, your father was principal at GLC, so what was that experience growing up you know, in, the kind of, in that college at that time? So, you know, it was a very interesting and I would say a very different kind of an experience. Because when I was born, my father became the principal of the government law college. And we had the, government, uh, the college quarters on the top floor of the building, like the, the GLC. Uh, and I have been there from right, uh, as I understand, mm -hmm. from age one or age two onwards. So the college was a very familiar environment for me. However, um, once I finished my graduation from the St. Xavier's College, I guess law was a natural law, not even option, was a natural thing for me to do. Having a father, I mean, having lived with a man who was my mentor, my father, someone whom I looked up to, my guru, as they call it. And uh, actually, we, we that's so much of law in the house. We were discussing a lot of things. And I think law was a natural thing for me to take up. And that's the reason I sort of joined and the natural college was the government law college. It was like coming home for me when I really joined um, after my graduation. And then, and then um, I mean, what was your thinking, you know, when you started your legal career? What were your kind of aspirations about becoming a lawyer? Okay, uh, so my uh, when I when I joined the law college, in fact, a little earlier than that also, I've always been a very ambitious person. I don't know, by nature. One of the reasons was my father, who really fueled that admission, uh, uh, you know, ambition in me to be uh, sort of you know to do something on the own. He was a very he was a great motivator. So when I joined the law college, honestly, I was uh, in two minds whether I should my law and join the profession. Or should I join politics? Because politics was also something which fascinated me immensely. Uh, and uh, I, I'm happy to share with you that when I joined my GLC in the first year, um, we had the college elections where I contested in the first year uh, as what is known as a ladies representative that was there, which was as good as the secretary of the um, association. And, and in GLC, and I'm talking about way back in the 80s, in GLC, it was like a political fight we were there. I was supported by a group of people who were from the Congress, if I may say so. And the others were supported by the non-Congress people. And we had big election campaigns, etc. of course, within the precincts of the college. Uh, but that's the fascinating part of the college. It offered us so, much, so many opportunities, so many options, and also made us motivate that. So whilst we were studying and all of us were doing, I was extremely active in the moot courts as we used to have it those days. I, 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 I presume you have it today also. And those moot courts were like mock courts and um, like we would sort of don a robe and go and argue a case for a plaintiff or a defendant, whatever the matter was, do a lot of research, uh, bring out case laws, 
uh, and argue for all the sitting judges of the Bombay High Court then, who were invited as special guests to deal with it. I remember Justice Pratap, I remember <clears throat> a couple of them who were there and who motivated us and inspired us to become um, lawyers. What had you what had you choose law over politics then? Because it sounds like you know either could have gone your way. So politics, nobody encouraged me to do that. I was the only one who was jumping about wanting to get into politics. But everybody said, no, 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 that's not meant for you. You take up law, that's a better profession, that's more stability, that is etc. So I guess it was more from that point of view. And I had no specific agenda of going into politics. It was just a fascination that I had. So, which continues even today. But the fact remains that ultimately I chose to have law as my profession and, and started studying the three years of it. So what's stopping you from taking on politics now, ma'am? Because the country could really use people like you, you know. So if you're making that transition, please, please make it slightly swiftly. Uh, you could ask the other panelist who is also on this is whether I should be it? taking is this up. It? <laughs> no. So I think no, no. So I, I think now it's all right. Now I can be only involved in it from a distance and uh, things like that. Uh, but yes, I think I'm happy that I've chosen law as a profession, and I'm very happy that uh, I've been able to pursue that. I've also studied with a view to be teaching law. So I was a professor of law at the Department of Law, University of Bombay, and the KC Law College where I was teaching constitutional law. So it was a combination of being a law teacher and a lawyer. I was not too sure what I wanted to be, to be very honest. Okay. And shifting the focus to you, Devika, you've had your father's a surgeon, you have doctors and lawyers in the family. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that you had very varied, varied interests after class 12. And then somehow you chose to study the law and then go ahead and practice it, went off to do your master's. Uh, what, what's that journey been like for you? And now you work with your mother. So that, that must be fairly interesting as well. <coughs> well, um, honestly, to be there was a tussle between my mom and dad. Okay, my father wanted me to be a doctor and he put it, his heart and soul to ensure that I was the best at biology and he really developed a great interest that I still have till date about the human body and it's just so fascinating. And the other thing I was very keen to do was uh, hotel management. And coming from a very typical middle-class Maharashtrian family, I was told, are you going to clean people's toilets? Are you going to peel, <laughs> you know, a hundred kilos of potatoes? Is that what you, you've studied all of this for? And, you know, obviously it was all in jest. Um, so, Choosing the law was 100% my mother, who's really pushed me. In fact, she went to the extent of trying to push one of my very close friends also to try and take up law, <laughs> who finally chose to do journalism and didn't buckle down. <laughs> but I did. And I'm glad that I did because I'm really enjoying uh, the law. Um, I don't technically work in her chambers. We do work together. Um, you know, we do work as a team, but I'm not in her chambers per se, but this has been a great journey and I'm glad I did choose it. <laughs> That's lovely. And ma'am, coming back to you, you took a large sort of sabbatical in between before you actually picked off, picked off the practice that you currently are an expert in, right? So tell us a little bit about that sabbatical and how it came about. Uh, so Tanisha, uh, as I said, I mean, it's rather strange and, and for girls of your age and your generation, it's going to be very uh, sort of, you know, strange to hear that whilst I was doing my first year of law, uh, my, I got engaged to Devika's dad and I continued my education second year and third year uh, whilst I was married. So I had a Mangal Sutra, I had a sari and I was to go. And I was the only one who was married in my college at that point of time. All my friends were unmarried, of course. Uh, however, <clears throat> after I finished my three years of law and I got my sanat, I did join the bar. Uh, and I, did, I was then working with the then Advocate General of Maharashtra, uh, Mr. Arvind Bobde, who incidentally were, uh, is the was the father of 
Justice Sharad Bobde, who is the current Chief Justice of India. So I had the privilege and honor of working in his chambers. And nothing like working in an AG's chambers as your first assignment, <clears throat> because you get a lot of work, a variety of work, and you can only observe and see all the big lawyers that come to the chambers, how they discuss the the matter, how they, what are their discussions, how how are they, what is their body language, and we used to just follow our senior to all the courts. I remember we had Justice S S K Desai then, one of the finest judges of the Bombay High Court, extremely handsome, extremely intelligent. Very, very temperamental, but extremely, extremely supportive of junior lawyers. I remember going there and ask uh, one of the matters. My um, my senior told me to go and ask for some adjournment. So I went to the court and I said, "Your lordships, I am appearing for so and so, and um, I'm seeking an adjournment in this matter because we need to file some reply in this." So he just said, "What is this adjournment? Adjournment about? Do you know what the matter is about?" Fortunately, I had studied a little bit and I knew what the matter was, not the details, but just the basics and all. So I said, yeah, Lodgett, I know this is about this. this is, I'm, I'm appearing for so-and-so. This is what the whole issue is and all that. He's saying, I am adjourning the matter for three days, provided you make a presentation and you argue before me and you will not get your senior to argue. It was a very small application. I said, okay. Uh, I will. You can't say no to a judge. Uh, I said, yes, your lordships, I will. I had all my, it was all knotted in my stomach and things. I just didn't know what it is. But that those were the kind of judges who pushed you and motivated you. And the more junior, more raw, more experience, inexperienced you are, the more they wanted you to study and come up. And trust me, three days or four days, it was the next week that I appeared before him. And I argued that matter very, very small at basic application for some service matter. I remember that much. And I argued before him. And then at the end of the day, he said, I'm passing orders at three o'clock. I said, here I go. I don't know what I have I done. Such a brilliant, intelligent judge who can even read the mind of the lawyers. He can read the mind of everyone. One of the sharpest judges of the Bombay High Court. And then uh, as luck would have it at three o'clock, the order was in my favor. I mean, I couldn't jump in the courtroom. <laughs> but internally, I was really jumping and dancing uh, that um, I could manage to get something. So these were the motivating moments which was there, which uh, sort of started. But whilst I was doing this, I was expecting my first child. That's Vikram. Vikram is my older son, who is also a counsel in the Bombay High Court on the original side. <clears throat> and we were staying at Vadala and my doctors asked me, that I used to travel by train those days uh, to high court. And my doctors told me that, no, you can't travel. It's a precious whatever pregnancy and you have to do that. So we said, okay. And then I took a break. That was in 82 July, August, if I'm not mistaken. Vikram was born in 83 March. Then I was busy looking after him, taking care of him. Devika was born in 1987. And I was taking care of her and looking after them. So I was a completely hands-on mom, hands homemaker, uh, just reading some news items and say, oh, this is what happened in high court. I wish I was there, but it's okay. I'm happy what I'm doing. So that was the kind of thing that happened. And I took a sabbatical for nearly 15, 16 years, by which time Devika and all of you were at a, at a stage where you would go to leave for school around eight o'clock and you would come back by three. So that gave me so much of time to do something for my practice and I worked that. And during the time that my children were young and I mean, they were very, very small, I did my master's in law because it was easier to sit at home and study. And I must make a mention here, Tanisha, it was my friend, a very good friend couple and my who was my neighbor then, who was instrumental in motivating me to do my master's. He said, listen, you are a very dedicated mother to both of them. But why can you not study? Don't practice law, but study law. Empower yourself with more knowledge. And I said, that's a good idea. And he really motivated me. And I was doing, I did my master's whilst my kids were young. Uh, I started doing part-time teaching for, a, for a, once a week for an hour or two that was there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the way it was. And once my kids were like, uh, these kids were coming back out from school around three o'clock. I started my practice absolutely raw, absolutely on a blank slate. Because Tanisha, you can't imagine after 15 years of sabbatical break or something what it is. It is as good as entering. It is as good as entering the first day of your college. 
true of and where did you learn whom did you learn from because i don't think you had a dedicated senior for this practice right no 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 i had no no senior in fact the the fact of the matter is that the reason i took up matrimonial law was because a, it was no not a it was only because it was closer to my home which was in bandra my home is in bandra east <clears throat> the courts are at bkc so if i walk down it's 10 minutes if i drive down it's 5 minutes so i knew that if i had to come back and my and my kids came home i could rush back and i could balance both the things which was there so that was the only motivating factor for me to take up matrimonial law because that gave me the time and the liberty to practice law and also be with my kids once they are back from home from school sure so you learned essentially i'm guessing from court clerks and and you know judicial yeah. so offices. so what happened is what i joined when i joined this as i was telling it was like a fresh slate not knowing anything which was there just sitting there and watching judges do something and i didn't even know how to make an adjournment application i was so blank actually with the procedural part of it so yes <clears throat> you are so right <clears throat> sorry you are so right it was the fantastic family culture of the family court if i may use that where the staff the, the stenos the sherastedars even sometimes the peons who were you know who were some some of them were graduates would would help us to do how to do it how to make an application how to tell the judge and things like that <clears throat> most of my you know when you file a petition uh, then there are certain technical objections which are there what a technical objection i didn't know so it was this clerk from the filing section who would teach me that this is what it is get your law so i think i really owe it to them i had no dedicated senior i had nobody and i just was this whole lot of determination and a burning ambition that okay now i've got an opportunity to do i want to do my best to the best of my ability that was the driving force which really motivated me to do that how wonderful thank you for sharing that thank you and uh, De- devika what was it like cuz like your mom said um I mean moving you know moving into the matrimonial um side was kind of uh it was convenient because you know she had you guys as young kids and you know the court was nearby so her whole career and where she is today has been shaped more because she's trying to get the family ba- work life balance and manage the kids but what was that like for you growing up then like your mom mentioned what it was like growing up at GLC and how that really kind of impacted her you mentioned your dad said your mom's Lloyd but what was it like having a working mom as well because even today um it's a challenge to get that balance for women to you know be with a family and develop a career um and a lot of women actually give up their careers and their passions and what they were doing once they're married and once they're kids so what was that like for you growing up you know with that kind of mom so growing up i mean this was much later was i remember my mom was always working very hard she we we're all early risers and she would wake up at 4 a.m and reading her briefs reading you know all of her big law books at that time which baffled me that books can actually be that big i remember there was this uh, old gentleman mr karkar who was one of her stenos who used to come home every sunday and i would really hate the fact that you know he would be in the living room and she'd be dictating and you know he'd be typing out all of her petitions but i mean now that i think back and i see the amount of work that she's put in you know she says it very casually that oh it was a matter of convenience that i live in bandra east and the court is here but i have seen her put in the hours i have seen her work so hard i have seen her i still remember i used to sit on her lap when she was you know studying for her llm and she tells me all of the stories and i have actually seen how hard she's worked to reach where she is at the moment and um she's always willing to learn even to to date she doesn't think she knows enough about matrimonial law i mean she's <laughs> she she really doesn't consider herself as a family law expert she's constantly you know she has this thirst for ambition and sometimes i have to tell her just take it easy like can we do something that's non law related or non work related and she just can't she can't take it easy so it's 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 a lot that's basically what i've grown up seeing i've seen a, a very hard working mother i have seen my father of course being a surgeon you know being in the hospital all day i've seen my grandmother 
who's also a professor and you know has done her phd in literature and was the head of the department of marathi and i have had such great role models that i had no option but to imbibe some of these uh, qualities which if i'm one third of what they are then you know i've i've arrived so it it was a- you missed out your brother on talking about him as inspiration he's a counsel as well right so did were you not inspired by his but we still hard work in longa i can never admit that i love or admire my brother <laughs> we <We'll> always <laughs> fight he'll always beat me up black and blue like he did in school now he can't <laughs> <laughs> yeah i trust you all are not putting on a show for your children so i mean we try we try to behave civil around the kids and teach them about non violence and i tell him hello you've given me the people's elbow in the choke slam <laughs> don't you teach your kid about <laughs> being gentle non violent yeah but yes of course he's 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 a lot like my mother he is also uh, i call him a geek because he's also a very very hard working counsel and who um, reads his uh, law briefs and uh, law books in his past time and always wants to update himself like every lawyer should so yes definitely a, a lot to learn from uh, this both sides of the family but especially the deshmukh side of the family <laughs> what what made you come back because you you gone to study in london obviously and you know do your masters at lsc right um, so what and you know many lawyers once you get that kind of break some you know spend more time in international markets doing different kind of laws but what made you then come back to india um so thanks to my mum i had interned whilst i was in law college at glc the five years that i was there and i was fairly certain that i wanted to get into litigation so a litigation law firm first to learn you know the nuances and the technicalities and the procedural aspect of it and eventually become a litigator or a counsel that is something i was very clear about and going to london i knew i would have to study all over again take the bar vocational course and you know be called to the bar and i was fairly certain that i wanted to settle in india um as regards matrimonial law that is something that happened by chance i remember when i was um, interning with one of the law firms a sole proprietor solicitor in fact my mum was short staffed she didn't have enough juniors they were either on like marriage leave or whatever maternity leave and she asked me to help her out with some of her drafting coming from a very civil uh, litigation background i had to draft a divorce petition and i did it very factually that on this date this happened this date that happened and i handed over over the draft and she said what is this it is so cut and dry you need to be a little bit more dramatic you need to you know make your petitioner like a demigod and the respondent like a villain you know with horns and <laughs> those things and i had no idea i had no idea that's what you know drafting a divorce petition would involve like i have to be a little bit more creative Long with words. my words yeah you can't be very factual <laughs> so um so it actually happened by chance and then slowly i really started enjoying it um i really uh, found the laws at times fascinating at times regressive you know not um, really in tune with today's time so all of those things really got me interested in the matrimonial aspect of the law and then came along surrogacy which is something that is very dear to my heart which i'm really also pursuing now so um it's it, that's it's actually all happened by chance for me i think you can you can you can share the the way we got into surrogacy also it will be interesting for everybody no, of what course. were the of course what were, what were the challenges i mean you you need not take the name but what were the challenges and things like that you know i mean it has been it has been a very evolving uh, you know legal subject and there are still no laws and it's all in the vacuum and uh, having to deal with those hurdles and having to hear stories of uh, couples or single people who've tried everything in the book to you know expand their family i mean and um, listening to their their side of the story and you know bringing that joy to them has also been uh, so satisfying work wise so definitely that's something we we are both very excited to do
Have you ever met the children that you've worked on maybe surrogacy yes. before? Yes. You have? I have. Yes. Yeah. I've seen. Yeah, Devika, Devika, we did. Devika, we did see I the did kids. See, yeah, but that was just the one case. But no, otherwise, it's just photos and videos. But that's exciting, isn't it? I mean, even seeing Absolutely. a picture, it I'm really- sure it evokes something in you. Absolutely. I mean, the joy, the joy that you see on the parents and the single parent as the case may be, it's just unparalleled. So. And also, Tanisha, I would like to add something here to the surrogacy part of it. Um, I would get a lot of uh, these, uh, you know, cases from Gynax, etc. More from the legal point of view that how legally sound it is and so on and so forth. Uh, my, my nature of work was, was something that took a, robbed me of a lot of my time. And this was something I was finding it difficult to do some more research. Mm-hmm. That's when I told Devika, Devika, will you start doing um, sort of, you know, more research on this? What are the IC? Because there's no law of surrogacy as we know, as we speak. There were the ICM, the Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, you know, guidelines, which were updated every two years, three years, whatever the case was. So I must say something to her credit that I trusted her so blindly to do the research in a manner <clears throat> that was so perfect because we were dealing with a case of a single parent and the law being uncertain, the social media being very uh, sort of, you know, against the whole issue, which was there. He was a well-known social celeb- uh, He is a well-known social, a socially known person, a celebrity as we call it. And that is why it was very, very important for us to know that the documentation, the advice and even counseling to that for that effect and I must share this with you that uh, Devika and me have also counseled the person who who became a who became a father and had a surrogate child children sorry <clears throat> to to be able to do that I think it it was it was just not a legal thing it was a combination of everything and I think that's where Devika played an extremely major part with her thorough mm-hmm. knowledge of it she just being on the top of all the ICMR regulations not wanting to violate even one small little word here and there. At the same time, ensuring that, uh, you know, the person is also taken care of so that emotionally it was a very different kind of a thing which was there. We did a lot of effort, spoke to the surrogate mother, found out. Because the popular, the belief was, oh, surrogacy, you know, it's exploitation, commercial exploitation of the surrogate mother were all the things that were going on in the media generally. And there was a lot of angst about this thing. I think that's where we did, and um, largely Devika did a lot of research, speaking to the surrogate mother, trying to find out whether it was really leading to any kind of commercial exploitation. Both of us went and met her there. And she seemed to be so happy because with the money that she was going to get, she was going to sort of, you know, buy a house. She was going to educate her children. And she said, what are you talking? I'm so happy I could do all these things. A, I can give joy to a person. And B, my whole family is going to get back and a better lifestyle, better education. So I think it was not just doing the documentation. It was a whole lot of experience that we did connected with the entire thing of surrogacy. Yeah, I think compassion in a practice like yours and high levels of empathy are two very essential aspects to be able to successfully the practice the kind of law you both do, right? And your conscience, it should gel with your conscience what you're doing, you know, to a large extent. I think that's very important. So speaking of surrogacy, because it's, you know, spoken so little of, is it, I just have one very small <coughs> question around it. Is it compulsory for the surrogate mother that, that you sort of go with uh, is it necessary that she should have had her own children and only then you know you can choose her as, as a surrogate is that Devika, one Devika is a better person to answer that yes that she, is. Right. and Tanisha as I told you you know the laws are still evolving it is still at a bill stage we're looking at it being passed anytime soon so the so you know it's 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 a vacuum at the moment there is no regulation in place and we're hoping that there would be some regulation so there's no um, you know black market or unregulated exploitation of women as as you know as is the fear um, and we hope some regulation would come about soon thanks has that, has that been a tough one because i'm sure um, it's quite a controversial thing especially for you know conservative society like what india is and especially you know under the kind of current climate we live in Um, So that you must have faced quite a bit of, at times, negativity, I think, with trying to push forward with supporting surrogacy. 
absolutely the first argument that you get is why not adoption why surrogacy now sometimes each person each individual has their right as to how they want to grow their family and who are we to you know dictate terms in how they should do it of course if it's against the law they won't be permitted to do it so yes there is a lot of backlash for surrogacy and i completely understand it is warranted backlash in term because there has been instances of exploitation of women and there have been instances of couples abandoning uh, children with special needs and you know disabled children and it it it's completely warranted the backlash that it does face but that doesn't mean that we still you know work in this bubble and in this vacuum if there's regulation i think a lot of the matters would be solved at least uh, that's the attempt sure you have you um i mentioned um, obviously for the surrogacy one you've given us a kind of example of some of the stuff you've learned through practicing but have you got any other kind of interesting anecdotes from you know both sides from devika you and dunali ma'am of where you've got into doing some cases matrimonial cases and you've really been you've learned something very new that's kind of opened your mind to like you know a whole new area you know having represented some you know doing some of these cases uh, so do i go in first devika yes please yeah um, so <laughs> so i so I I I mean if I look back uh it's been 20 years now since I'm in this practice if I look back now and I see the number of cases that I've done uh yes there have been a whole whole it's a whole broad spectrum of them and I was fortunate enough to do a variety of cases uh what I have learned over the period of all these interesting cases is that I have learned law I have learned human mind I have learned how emotions can go awry i i've learned that how as a lawyer you need as panisha rightly said to have a sense of compassion a immense sensitivity and immense uh, sort of you know patience and tolerance to listen to all the all the uh, instructions or the, the the way they are sharing this thing uh, i learned a lot in my practice on the muslim in the muslim law that is the sharia law Uh, i remember i was doing a very well known case of again um, the outside was uh, is a very well known celebrity and this was a muslim case we were doing and for the first time i came across something where the family court on a petition which was made by the husband saying that this petition should be dismissed because my marriage to my wife is not valid because she is not done halala so we said oh god what is halala i mean this is something so so um, sort of you know um, i mean i heard it for the first time so apparently under the muslim law if a husband and a wife uh, there is a divorce which is granted or, or uh, pronounced not granted talaq pronounced and if the husband and the same husband and wife have to get back together and get remarried they cannot do so under the muslim law the wife has to get married to somebody else the second marriage of the wife has to be consummated then she has to divorce the second husband and only then she can come back to the first wife and this was a concept of law which i had not learned which i had not heard and this was something when we were dealing with and i remember the, the that i mean i must confess that i took a lot of efforts to read the law we traveled all the way to delhi with my client to speak to two three muslim scholars Uh, to understand what this entire law is, because this is absolutely a new, a new arena for us. Um, the lower court did not grant me the order where we were opposing the halala, but the high court division bench granted me the order, and there I think it was a very fascinating learning experience and a fascinating facet of law that we I was not aware of it. How long did it take you to get through that? Because that sounds quite a complex matter to have come up. Yes, uh, but it took us. I mean, by the time we travelled from the lower court to the high court and all that, it was two or three months. And uh, I, I was able to, and my client and me were determined to get it. We made two trips to Delhi. I vividly remember met some of the highest uh, uh, Muslim law scholars who were based in uh, Delhi. I uh, learned a lot from them took notes made out things and argued in the court and we got the order yeah that was a satisfying part of it and it was more of a sense of justice that how can a woman be just be abandoned by some kind of archaic thing 
utmost respect to the religion and the religious practices, <clears throat> but which was so so against uh, just just throwing away a woman from a relationship was something that was uh, against the dignity of a woman, and that is the reason why there was an extra effort on my part to really study, really find out what is a way out, and really give her that dignity which she rightly deserved. That was the passion behind doing this. That's amazing. Um, Devika, have you got any stories from your kind of practice? Yes, I do. So um, in terms just very quickly about how I had to also learn to deal, especially in matrimonial disputes, when the client comes to you with so much hurt, so much anger, uh, sometimes so much vengeance. And for you to not be perturbed with that you know, that emotion for, for everything that they're telling you, their bedroom secrets and, you know, everything that nobody else knows that they're, they're, you know, confessing and confiding you in you. And for you to look at that a little clinically, unemotionally, neutrally, um, it was a bit of a challenge for me initially, obviously, um, especially as being newly married also, you know, you start, you start questioning, oh, really, is that, is that an issue? And, um, that has been that has been a little uh, difficult to come to terms with especially with custody battles and to give advice because it's like going to a doctor if i go to a doctor and tell the doctor my kids are unwell and the doctor's like oh my god the doctor's crying away you don't want to go to a doctor like that you want to go to somebody who's sorted and who can tell you you know what how they can help you best so that has uh, really been a bit of a challenge for me and uh, on a on a side note and a really funny anecdote that i have is that i have spent a good uh, I would say three weeks trying to help uh, a negotiated settlement um, about the custody of a cat. And we had to <laughs> really draw up terms about uh, the visitation and the medical expenses. <laughs> and if the one of the parties is traveling, you're supposed to give prior written intimation so the cat can be <laughs> transferred from one room to the other and you know it's like it reminded me of one of those memes that have I studied for six years <laughs> to to help with the dispute and custody of cats so that has been a really you, you did that with a straight face <laughs> I had to <laughs> you see <laughs> <I'm> emotional <laughs> so freaky I started watching suits for the yeah. first time because we interviewed Shadul Shroff recently and he mentioned suits so I got in from series one Yesterday, we were watching an episode on uh, a surrogacy battle over a cat with Lit. So it was Lewis Lit fighting his other partner for a cat. I, I, I have done it. It's insane. I'm like, oh my God. And I have traveled from uh, South Bombay to Andheri, which is quite a distance, just for the negotiated settlement on cats because the other side lawyer was a senior to me. And... I was like, oh my God, this is really not <laughs> worth the travel time, but you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's um, interesting. Thank you both for sharing your journeys and these anecdotes so freely. It's been very enjoyable, but we're moving to a more fun segment now. Uh, right? So we're off to, this brings us to the end of the interview round. And we're going to now move on to word sneak for the benefit of our viewers. Word sneak is where each of our guests are given five to seven words each. They have to have an organic, well, pretend to have a perfectly organic conversation to weave in the words in the same order. The words will be displayed in your chat windows for the for the benefit of our guests. Uh, Devika and Rinalini, ma'am, I'm going to send your words to you on WhatsApp. So you can check your WhatsApp immediately and we can get started. Um, we'll just quickly play the able. We're trusting the both of you not to exchange notes and not to share each other, you know, your words with the other. Has Manalini ma'am left this <laughs> interview because she doesn't want to play words? No, 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 no. I'm I'm very much here. Okay, uh -huh. no, no. Yeah. So you tell me whenever I'm I'm okay. Okay, you'll have to turn your camera on, ma'am. It's okay, I'll do that. Yeah. And it, and it should be a fluid conversation between both of you. 
So right. Doctor, you need so your you words message to you here on the chat. They will display. Then it'll be easier to display them on your screen. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer that? Uh, so I have it. My whatever you've given me right now, but that's oh. fine. You can get, you can oh. put it on this also. Sure, that's you, fine. You both can start now, please. And Neha, uh, Devika, please don't look at your uh, word chat, please. Thank no you. Not to. <laughs> okay. So, uh, mom, Devika. Did you get those? Um, I sent you some Malawi mangoes, which are quite sweet, and we tried them at home. And um, some of the imported strawberries, I, I, they were just simply delicious. Did you get them? I had them delivered to your house earlier today. Oh yes, I did enjoy those uh, those lovely fruits. Thank you so much for sending it. But um, you know, Devika, uh, I mean, more than the fruits, what I really love about these things is the way they are grown, the trees, the tree houses, which are there in the jungles, in the fields, which are there. I think I would love to have something that life experience rather than having them just on my table, very fresh, you know, something to that effect will be very effective, I think. I, I agree. In fact, uh, I've heard people talk to the plants and talk to crops, you know, so that they grow better and, um, like my favorite artist Beyonce once said, you got to put your love on top. So I guess that that uh, is also a very important part of um, you know, getting the good produce, I guess. Maybe you should get, you should try some gardening and... Yes, you know, I'm having that. Yes, absolutely. You can do that. So... Uh. Um, it's interesting that uh, at the beginning of this interview, you mentioned to Tanisha and Vikas that you've always wanted to be a politician, but uh, I don't think they know that you cry every single time the national anthem comes on. And as a politician, <laughs> you do know you're going to have to <laughs> sing or be present at a national anthem. And at that time, you can't be crying the whole time. You're, I mean, you're the biggest patriot I know but a little bit too emotional when it comes to the Indian flag. I just show you an Indian flag and I can guarantee buckets of tears. Well, well, that's the way I am. So that's the passion I have for the country. And that is why probably politics was something which was there. Uh, but uh, having said this, Devika, I mean, I have seen a lot of people who, who are most eligible, either, uh, you know, uh, single women, bachelors, all eligible, but devoting themselves for the sake of the nation and doing things because that's what fascinates them so much. Uh, that's a passion that they have. And I really wonder, they do not want to have any of these family life, but go ahead with their single-minded devotion and passion to do for the country. I think I really salute those, those single women, and those eligible bachelors who've given up the, the probably the comfortable um, family life for the sake of the nation. I really feel proud about such people. Uh, true, absolutely true. I mean, there are some people who, <coughs> uh, you know, um, create a bit of an obstruction and are very anti-nationalist, um, you know, when they shouldn't be at times. And um, I guess we should just ignore those people, right? I, what, what would you suggest? What do you do with people who are trying to just ruin it for us, for the progress of our country? Should absolutely. I absolutely. Yeah, they, they need to be dealt with very sternly and very strictly. That's where I think somewhere the belief in God comes in, that if something is not going well, at least there is God above us. For us, Ganpati. And with Ganpati comes the delicious Modaks, which your grandmother is such an excellent Yum. cook and makes them, and which your son, Shan, so loves it, but calls it a cookie. <laughs> so I think I think if you if you see that God above us, yes, really. And uh, I think God above us is there. And I think my nation is here to stay and to become a superpower. I'm so confident about it. I agree. I mean, as much as I love the modaks, I do also enjoy my wine and bread and cheese. And that may not be a very Indian thing to love, but it is definitely one of my favorites. So I'm not going to be able to let go of that for a while, even though it may not be very good for the waistline. So, uh, so Devika, as you would understand, and you've seen it in our home whilst we were growing up and things like that, that 
every family members, whether, whether it was Vikram, it was you, it was me, we always had our points of view and we would put that forward, whether we were having it, we were at the dinner table or we were sitting outside in the living room and chatting and things like that. And at times it would take a shape of arguing with each other. So probably that innate being a lawyer gets your putting across your views so, so uh, sort of, you know, translated into arguments that I remember a couple of times when we used to talk, your father and your grandmother would say, hello, 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 this is not a court. Stop arguing. Learn to talk. Don't argue. So I think, I think that's something uh, that came so naturally for, for all three of us, Vikram, you and me. And um, I think, I guess that's why we are in this profession. You're so and right. of I agree. And it used to get so heated at times, our arguments at the dinner table, and we'd really be screaming almost at the top of our lungs. And I think we have to learn to be a little bit uh, calmer. And, and, and I know you always tell me this, and I always tell you as well that, you know, let's just uh, be a little soft spoken and uh, patient. And uh, honestly, motherhood, oof. That has taught me patience and how <laughs> I had no idea I could be this patient. Gosh, to have to manage a toddler who's just running all over the house and <laughs> throwing things. It's, it's really taught me a lot and patience is definitely one of them. I think I learned patience 40 years back when I got married to your dad. That was the beginning of learning patience. The rest, the rest has been history. And then came Vikram, then came Devika. Somewhere down the line, somewhere down the line, I have, I may want to write uh, an autobiography, become a published author, and just write anecdotes of what it is to be a wife, a mother, and a grandmother, and, and et cetera, et cetera, and how it's really important to have patience written all over you. And I think to that, you should also add chef because, oh my God, the food that you make, especially the typical Maharashtrian masale bhat, oh, it's to die for. And uh, that could be something that you could also add to your resume. <laughs> family I, think, I, th I think that's a very interesting part of it. Uh, my resume will have a lot of my hobbies and a lot of my sort of, you know, uh, uh, what, what I do. But if you ask me honestly, what has really been my sort of greatest hobby right from a child, and this I'm talking about, uh, I think when I was in the eighth standard or the ninth standard, has been badminton. And as you know that even till date of my age, I still with my all my limitations of age, movement, and so on and so forth, sharpness of breath and all, I still pursue and that passion of playing badminton uh, to be able to sort of follow my dreams. So if not politics, yes, badminton, yes. That's a great idea. You'll be great at that as well. Fantastic. Uh, so at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we, we've, we've been talking about our passions, about what we like to eat, what we were doing, how we were arguing and how things were there. But the most gratifying and the most satisfying thing for me, uh, all this, and something which you know brightens up my face, lights up my eyes and my entire thing, is to see my children and my grandchildren. The joy that I get from just having, being, being with them, seeing them is unparalleled and cannot, I cannot, cannot even ever think about anything that can give me great, greater joy than all of you guys being in my life. Next Sorry, time. I'm getting emotional. Next time you give me a tough time, I'm going to show you a recording of this. Good. You cannot allow anybody to use this as an evidence in any any <laughs> individual or even things places. You this Does disclaimer should have come at the beginning, ma'am. Now it's too late. Come this on, it's, it's all in the family, Tanisha. You can do it. <laughs> But so good. You both were so smooth. And yet, <laughs> kept it so relevant. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, Thank you so much. This brings us to the end of segment two, which is called Word Sneak. We're going to move on to segment three, which is where you legitimately get to point a finger at one another. And you will not hear, uh, you know, hear from the other. Because your entire, the, the, the aim of this game is, we ask you a question. 
and you if you think it applies to you you point inward if you think it applies to the other point outward please place your hands in a way that we can see what you're doing before the camera and are we ready for this let's quickly play the av and then start playing the game also cover your eye one hand covers your eye <laughs> Okay, uh, ma'am, please cover your eyes with one hand. Keep one hand towards the camera, both of you, please. Vikas okay. is going to shoot a bunch of questions, and you have to respond. Go, Vikas. Right. Who is the better lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who's more likely to go shopping without a wallet? <laughs> <laughs> Who is more likely to forget where they parked their car? <laughs> <laughs> Who is more likely to raid the other's cupboard? Sorry, I didn't get you. Raid the other's cupboard, wardrobe. Raid, raid the cupboard. Steal from she, the other. Who else? She's a master. <laughs> I think. Who is the fashionista? She. <laughs> Whom do family members turn to for advice? Devika. Can't say who, that. Who is the bigger crybaby? <laughs> <laughs> who is more likely to be indecisive with simple decisions? <laughs> who is the drama queen? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my turn. Who is more likely to shoplift? Shoplift? Yes. Inadvertently. <laughs> <laughs> okay then. Who is more likely to help uh, a friend bury a body? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> you your hand. <laughs> oh, I'm most likely. <laughs> okay, but but Devika, you have to seriously answer that one. Oh, okay. Okay. Who is more likely to use profanities? <laughs> Who is more likely to own an illegal business? None. None. Devika used to run one back in college, ma'am. You don't know anything. Ignorance <laughs> is bliss. Tanisha, ignorance is bliss. That is true. Who is more likely to eavesdrop on a conversation? None. None of my children, and none, neither me. You are making this very boring. Who is more likely <laughs> to fail a math test? <laughs> okay. Hundred percent. Who is more likely to order pizza or dessert in the next forty-eight hours? <laughs> and the last one, who is more likely to forget the kids at school? Me. <laughs> <laughs> you both can open your eyes. Well done. I'm so disappointed that y'all don't eavesdrop and y'all don't want to run any illegal business. <laughs> what no. a pity. Listen, but I, I just, I'll just share one small example. When Vikram was born, I had gone to my dad's place, and he was around three months of of age. Mm -hmm. And the baby, uh, Vikram, was sleeping inside on my mother's bed, and uh, we all had dinner, and we left. By the time we got into the car, we realized, oh my God, Vikram is still there. So that's the reason, and this is something which has really happened to me. Uh, and then we went back because we just newly a first baby, and you just forget, forget about it. So that's what happened to me. Oh so that's the reason I admitted that you know I could be the person for likely. Fair. Thank you for being honest. This was fun. <laughs> okay, we shall now move on to the last segment, which is called the interrogation. You both have to answer swiftly and uh, accurately, and don't take too long. We'll quickly play the AV, and then we'll get straight to the question. All right. Are you both ready? Yes. So we'll we'll start with one of you, and then midway we'll just switch turns. Okay. All right. So Devika, if not a lawyer, what would you be? Teacher. Ma'am, how about you? If not a lawyer, what would you be? Prime Minister of this country. Okay. Okay. One piece of advice, ma'am, that you would give advice or warning that you would give anybody who's considering getting married. Oh, when you're getting married. 
go with your eyes open remember patience is the key word remember tolerance is the other key word and remember be gracious enough to accept that you have that uh, you are done something wrong or incorrect and there's nothing wrong in apologizing i think this is the warning that i would like to give you okay and they will come back you uh, love is not enough it takes a lot more than just being madly in love to uh, you know make your marriage work and uh, go in knowing that fully well that it's not like they show you in the movies <laughs> which my husband often tells me <laughs> fair okay super next question ma'am for you you run your own chat show whom would you like to invite first and why good living person difficult uh hmm some some uh, someone uh, like uh, justice chandrachur nice so so would we we're hoping to make it happen some day so yes and the unsuited team hears you okay how about <laughs> sivika oprah winfrey of course okay you know that tanisha <laughs> <laughs> all right what is ma'am for you what is a recent trend that you're completely on board with it could be fashion it could be texting any recent trend i think the recent trend which i'm completely on board with is uh the <clears throat> how do i put it the flexibility of adapting to your 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 you know your clothes etc according to what the season is or what the requirement is rather than whether at a particular age that will go well or it will not go well Okay. To be open to try out all those things. different things. Okay, how about you, Devika? Um, I read this research that uh, one glass of red wine is equivalent to one hour of cardio. So I'm on board with that. I do my cardio very often. <laughs> nice. <laughs> very nice. Okay. Next question: If you could know the absolute truth to one question, what what would you want to know, Devika? Hmm. what the uh, what goes on in the minds of growing babies newborns and toddlers i would love to know how their brain is growing exponentially and what what sort of neurological connections are going on in there that's something i really would love to know like to know okay fair as a new mother that sounds like a very fair ask <laughs> how about you ma'am what would you like to know the answer to one one absolute truth what is life really and what is the reality of life it may sound philosophical maybe but really i want to know what is all what is the reality of life okay what is transitional and what is real okay that's that's very very uh, sort of deep and philosophical indeed moving on to a more fun question ma'am your job is to counsel and convince melania trump to stay married to donald trump what do you say to her so difficult for a difficult job you're giving me my god i'll have to use all my skills to do that and i tell her that okay the only answer here is known devil is better than the unknown so please stick on you one never knows politics is so uncertain four years down the line you may once again become the first lady so so ladies stick on that's the only thing okay and devika you are in fact on the other side and you have to actually convince her to move on very very quickly what, what do you say to her well i would say to her that uh, hello lady wake up <laughs> what is wrong with you why have you been married to this man for so long <laughs> time to get out of this and smell the roses there's way better things out there for you okay super well done both of you next question ma'am for you one time in your life that was a little challenging fairly challenging and what you learned from it so in fact the most challenging time was for me to get into practice after 20 year i mean after 15 years of a hiatus and a, and uh, and what did i learn from it i think i learned a uh, it i learned a very very hard lesson of life that a nothing is impossible if you really want to do that secondly there's no substitute to hard work and this has been my sort of mantra for my work which is there and third thing which i learned from that is life is full of surprises and what you thought was unachievable 
it's something that you can do it. And I think you get to work for it. Wonderful. And Devika, how about you? The same question to you, uh, a challenging I, time. I would not really say it would be, it was a challenging one, but it is definitely something that makes you think a lot when you're deciding as to the career that you're choosing. And, um, and in the career, the stream or the focus area that's going to be, because you never know if you're going to be good enough. You're never going to know if you know you are cut out for it and you have to dive in head first. And that's what I've learned that you always learn on the job. You're never ready for anything. You're never ready for a case. You're never ready till you actually even argue the case. So I've learned that you have to just dive in head first, give it your all, work as hard as you can, and then just leave the rest to, you know, whatever the outcome's meant to be. Super. Okay. One thing that experience has taught you, but you really wish it were taught in school. Ma'am, you answer that one first. That experience has taught me and it wish. And how you wish you were taught this, what, whatever the learning in school. But you've actually learned it only through experience. I think the only thing that I have learned through experiences uh, is, of course, I repeat at the cost of repetition that there's no substitute to hard work. I wish I had done that in school. I would have had better grades and better marks uh, because I was never a topper I was I used to flunk in maths my art was pathetic and uh, so many other subjects that I was so bad and I never even worked for it but after I got into the profession I learned nothing is impossible and the only thing is the thirst for learning improving and working hard on it I wish I'd done that in school I would have got better grades you know Tanisha one does <laughs> Fair enough. Devika, how about you? Um, I wish I would ta taught about finances and uh, managing your money and, you know, investing because it's still such a struggle to understand whether you're making the right decision. And it's so important to teach money and, you know, how to manage your money. So I wish I were taught that. Fair. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, ma'am, this is, this is first for you. There's an earthquake. You have only five minutes to grab things in the house. What is it that you run for? Oh, good one. Uh, my pair of glasses, my phone, okay. and whatever money is available in my bag, and just run with that. And your husband? <laughs> I can't carry him, no? So, but anyway, my husband will he'll also run on his own. I don't think I need to pull him or push him and get it done. I just, I just wanted <laughs> to make a mention. That's, that's a good point, but I did think about it, Tanisha. Thank you for making me realize that. <laughs> Anytime. Devika, how about you? Um, my son and, you know, whoever close family that I can sort of get out that comes under one. Uh, number two would be all my important documents, your passport and Aadhaar, because you don't want to be stuck in that bureaucratic, <laughs> this thing of getting a new passport, yeah. Aadhaar and everything. Uh, phone, money and, um, and my memory box. I have a little memory box with... Uh, you know, things from my past, things from, from my sons when he was grown up. So that box. Is oh, well. Wow, how nice. Okay, super. All right, next question. Ma'am, what tells you the most about a person? Like when you need to meet a new person, what tells you the most about that person? Uh, I mean, what attracts me the most, you mean? No, like how, what is the measure by which you can really decipher a lot about who that person is? I think, I think... Uh, the body language of the person and once I see him or her in the eyes, I find out the sincerity part of it. I think one of the things that Tanisha, my profession has taught me is to is to know people and to read them a little bit. I don't claim to be an expert in that, but I think I'm able to now read people who are who are really being genuine in what they're saying and how much of it is a drama or how much of it is it coming from something else. Yes, I think the body language, That's I would say so. Okay. And Devika, how about you? For me, it would be conversationally. Once they start talking, you immediately, you know, you get a vibe and you also realize, you know, how, what sort of a person, the personality of the person you it just comes through. Okay. Okay. EQ or IQ? What is more important, ma'am? EQ. Absolutely. 100% EQ. Absolutely. Emotional quotient. And, you know, I've been dealing with a lot of these cases, Tanisha, and on a little more serious note, when I see all these children in these custody battles, etc., it is so important for them to have that emotional quotient. 
as much as you can work on it. You may have a little, you may have an average IQ. You may have a little less than an average. You can work hard. You can do it. But to have that emotional stability and EQ, I think, is very, very important to make you a better person. Fair, okay. Same. What are your top three weaknesses, Devika? Chocolate. Uh, cute babies. And uh, rom coms. Rom coms. <laughs> How about you, ma'am? Your top three weaknesses. My weaknesses are uh, food, which is sometimes unwarranted and undesirable, which is, which goes straight into your hips, as they say. <laughs> the the other weakness is uh, that professionally I'm able to read people better. But personally, I'm very gullible and uh, sort of, you know, fall for it on a, at a personal level, you know, whether it's a friend or whether it's a relative or it's something which is there. That is the second weakness that I have. And thirdly, increasingly now, and I must say, I would want to blame partly to my profession and partly to all the trouble that my kids have given me, a little bit of my temper and my temperament. <laughs> But I'm not responsible for that. It's one of them is on the show and the Correct. other one is at home. It's them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. In fact, when you speak of the second weakness, uh, Devika, you know, because you're gullible, Devika's had you wound around her little finger for years now. So. I wish. Oh, yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last question on this segment, ladies. One thing, Devika, that you hugely admire about your mother. Oof. There are only one thing, huh? then it would have to be her persistent, relentless thirst to learn and better herself in every way possible. And the enthusiasm and energy and industry and all of that is just is admirable and very difficult, huge shoes to fill, which is going to be a task for me. Ma'am, how about you? One thing you hugely admire about your daughter. Her supreme intelligence, her head over her shoulders, and her, her. in fact, you will be surprised I sometimes go to her for an advice, which could be even on a personal nature, and share things with her. Because I know the kind of feedback that I can get from her would be a very, very objective way about it, not getting involved, but being sensitive about it. So she has got this innate, innate uh, sort of, you know, quality where she she retains the sensitivity, but also the objectivity, if you know what I mean. So she can, she has the, she has a mix of both. And that's why what comes out as an advice or a suggestion or something is absolutely something that has a long lasting effect. And I have learned a lot from her or I go to her for some of these things when I'm in a little bit of a, you know, quandary or not too sure about it. Fair. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. All right. That brings us to the end of the interrogation round. Thank you, ladies, for playing it candidly and honestly. It was fun. Uh, we you. have a couple of questions that we're going to quickly ask you from the audience. Uh, do you have a couple of moments to take a few questions, please? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so there's one question where uh, the person is asking, in this COVID era, we're hearing more and more about more and more domestic dis disputes. Uh, can you share your views on this, please? Because, you know, that we've heard that uh, the pandemic and everyone sort of being homebound has led to more marital discord in some cases. Do you feel like that's true? That's what they're asking. Is it, is it for me or Devika? You can go first. Either I'm... one of you. Yeah, both of you. Doesn't matter. So, uh, yes, and we're talking about, let's say, from April onwards that I, I've been noticing that I have been getting quite a few cases which are there, which are in the nature of, and I don't mean domestic violence as in somebody beating up the other spouse or something, but violence has been from in many forms, not, not giving enough money to run the house, okay? Second kind of thing is, uh, in some cases, online affairs of one of the spouses, because you have all the time in this world and then you, whatever, Tinder, I don't even know what those apps are, Tinder but you get, whatever you get onto them and whilst your spouse is in the same house and then there is this lack of things which was there. So that is the other part of it is there. The third part of it is that because of the extreme, I think it becomes very difficult for 24 hours for two people to be in the same space no, is only because each one of you needs a space and it get, you know getting in each other's face 
unnecessarily raises a lot of temper issues and a lot of adjustmental issues. I have seen a lot of people saying that, listen, he just follows me wherever I go. So good or bad? <laughs> no, not good. Because I can't breathe. Because he's at home. He, I, I said, but otherwise you're completely, he ignores me. He doesn't even look at me and doesn't even do that. So it's been a mixed thing. It's been, and a lot of this in the lockdown, a lot of things has been the insecurity of the COVID and what is, you know, what may have happened to the near and the dear ones or the cases that we read about it. And thirdly, and more importantly, it's just being locked in the house, in the lockdown, that makes matters worse. So there have been a, quite a few cases, I must say that. Yeah, and also to add to that, I think some amount of uncertainty that all of us are experiencing as individuals, yes. right? Yes, There's a absolutely. great amount of anxiety. And for people who had monetary impact on their jobs, uh, there's also that angle that then sort of weaves into these relationships. So I guess there are many, many facets to it. And also, Tanisha, just since we are on this subject, uh, we I got a lot of calls where, say, the non-custodial parent had visitation rights to the child. And because of the COVID and because of this lockdown, was not able to have any access. Some of the mothers were, were good enough, or let's call it a custodial parent, were good enough to give access through video calls and FaceTimes and things like that. But some of them were sticking to the rules because that was their way of getting back at the father by saying, no, 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 this COVID, you can't enter my society. This is not allowed. That is not allowed. And depriving the, the non-custodial parent of the child and child of this and creating a lot of anguish and pain for the non-custodial parent. So this was not exactly domestic violence, but this was a lot of anguish for a non-custodial parent for not being able to see the child in case of custody issues or whatever separation issue. And the, and the way they used to come, and some of them have really cried on the phone. And they said, why can we not see? I mean, what is this law about? I mean, if she's a mother and she can take care, why can't I go and see? I'm, I'll get my COVID test done. I'll do this. I'll do that. So that was something was a lot of pain for these non-custodial parents during these, um, uh, you know, lockdown period, especially. Sure. Okay. Thanks for answering that. Devika, maybe, maybe I can ask you the next question. Sure. So when people are considering getting married today, yeah. Are there any legal aspects they should consider before making it official? Is there any advice you'd like to give couples that are getting married? Well, absolutely. I feel uh, like every other significant thing that you do legally, uh, whether it's voting or buying a house or whatever it is, it always comes with some sort of instruction manual, some sort of, you know, rules and regulations. But marriage does not and uh, you really don't know what to expect and which I feel is so important to be um, well aware of what you're getting into not only in terms of legally what happens to your assets and how you are looked at in the eyes of law but also on a more personal level that how your life changes a whole 360 degrees and how you can't be thinking about just yourself so that is that is one thing that I would really like to you know ask newly people who plan to get married and also um, something which is not uh, which is considered to be against public policy in India I think prenups I think prenups are something that we should really start having a conversation about because I truly believe when you know you have a very healthy relationship where you can discuss the what ifs or you know if this happens and if at that time where you have enough security in your relationship to discuss that if things were not to go down, you know, smoothly, then how do we divide our assets or how do we deal with certain situations? It speaks a lot of your relationship at that point and makes a, the conversation a lot easier at that point. And I really think we start having a conversation around, you know, making prenups uh, enforceable in the eyes of law. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Thanks for that. All right, I think those were primarily the questions that were out there. Thank you for answering those. It was really lovely talking to the both of you. Thanks for making the time for agreeing to do this and Thank just being yourselves. Thank you, Tanisha, for not roasting me. I was really so afraid of being roasted. I'm glad you held it together.
<laughs> you can call me later and say all the things that you want to. <laughs> we will watch this together and then I will give you live commentary when we watch it together. So that will be a whole different episode. Okay. Uh, we, we'll, we'll charge for that though. That won't be free for our viewers. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> we'll definitely do that. But thank you. It was lovely uh, having the both of you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for gracing us with your time and presence. My pleasure. Thank you for having us here, Tanisha. It was indeed a great evening, must say that. Thank you. you. Thank you, Tanisha and Vikas. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, Thank you. it was great interacting with you also and uh, sort of, you know, uh, sharing my thoughts on the subjects that you thought you wanted to know about it. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Our pleasure. See you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.